Utopia is a thriller slash drama television series that follows a group of people who meet in an online forum and bond over an obscure graphic novel that has predicted several epidemics. Somehow one of them gets their hands on a lost manuscript of it and they all plan to meet up and check it out. After this meeting, their lives kinda go to shit and they're hunted down by people from this organization known as The Network. Utopia is an incredible show that's also very dark and doesn't shy away from the nature of the subject it's depicting. In the show, the main conspiracy we uncover is Janus. Janus is a serum designed to sterilize over 90 to 95 percent of the human population. It's broken into two parts, a protein called GCN1 that's added into industrially farmed corn and an amino acid added to a vaccine for Russian flu. Separately, they're harmless, but when these two components come together, they set the plan in motion. Throughout the show, we see the main group struggle to figure out how to survive in this messy world and how to stop the network from unleashing Janus to the population. And though the show had an ambiguous ending, it's not too far-fetched to assume that the network did succeed in releasing Janus in the world. The network is a group founded on the basis of saving humanity. And they want to do this by eliminating a large percentage of the population because they predict the future will be incredibly bleak with humans killing each other over limited resources. Philip Carvel, the co-creator of the network and also the scientist that spearheads this research, makes breakthroughs at the detriment of using his own children as test subjects. He eventually cracks the code and decides to make an alteration. He wants to isolate a specific race so they are basically immune to the adverse effects of the vaccine. An assertion that makes his assistant appropriately react to him by saying, the third fucking Reich. He later ends up choosing his own people, the Roma people, to spare from the vaccine, mostly because he doesn't want it affecting his daughter. Throughout the show, the network uses a lot, and I mean a lot, of violence, coercion, and deception to get their plans in motion. Which makes sense because when you think you're working for the greater good, there's no boundary you won't cross really. The show echoes a lot of eco-fascist rhetoric, even though it sort of tries to flip that on its head by choosing a different and more oppressed group to prioritize. But the principles are still the same. Ecofascism is a political model where individuals are required to sacrifice their own personal interests for the preservation of the land. It combines racial purity with environmental purity, coupled with a romanticization of the rural past. According to Science the Wire, quote, Ecofascists believe that environmental damage is a product of displaced populations, especially of minority groups. At its core, ecofascism upholds the rights of one race over others to the environment and its riches. While a large number of far right conservatives deny climate change, ecofascists acknowledge it but promote xenophobic and racial solutions. End quote. Cited as one of the earliest examples of ecological thinking, Ernst Mars Arndt, a fanatical nationalist whose love for nature was second only to his love for Germany, was one of the founding fathers of German nationalism. In Ecofascism Revisited, Lessons from the German Experience by Janet Beale and Peter Staudenmeier, Staudenmeier states, quote, While best known in Germany for his fanatical nationalism, Arndt was also dedicated to the cause of the peasantry, which led him to a concern for the welfare of the land itself. Historians of German environmentalism mention him as the earliest example of ecological thinking in the modern sense. His remarkable 1815 article on the care and conservation of forests, written at the dawn of industrialization in Central Europe, rails against short-sighted exploitation of woodlands and soil, condemning deforestation and its economic causes. At times, he wrote in terms strikingly similar to those of contemporary biocentrism, quote, when one sees nature in a necessary connectedness and interrelationship, then all things are equally important. Shrub, worm, plant, human, stone, nothing first or last, but all one single unity, end quote. 
Arndt's environmentalism, however, was inextricably bound up with virulently xenophobic nationalism. His eloquent and prescient appeals for ecological sensitivity were couched always in terms of the well-being of the German soil and the German people, and his repeated lunatic polemics against miscegenation, demands for teutonic racial purity, and epithets against the French, Slavs, and Jews marked every aspect of his thought. End quote. Arndt's student, Wilhelm Heinrich Rehl, furthered his ideas. Many of Rehl's work became integral in the Volkish thought. The Volkish movement is described as a combination of ethnocentric populism with nature mysticism. It reformulated the traditional German antisemitism into more nature-friendly terms. While the conservationist movement and Nazis were closely linked, so much so that the members had to actively work to denazify the movement post-war, it's important to note that conservationism pre the Nazis and was not created by them. While some conservationists aligned with the Nazi ideology, many did not. Originally, conservationists blamed industrialization and urbanization for the ruin of nature. The Nazi ideology solely seeped in and turned the blame to quote-unquote Jewish conspirators. In Santiago G. Lozada's thesis from Green Pastures to Scorched Earth, German Environmentalism and Ecology, he states, quote, The protection of the Heimat's fusion with nationalism seeped into the Third Reich, twisting nature conservation to fit into Nazi ideology. Environmentalism during the Nazi era emphasized the importance of nature to the health of the people. What makes this emphasis distinctive to Nazi conservation lies in the reality of how they implemented this thought. By categorically and systematically equipping the regime to physically eliminate European Jewry, the Nazis were, quote unquote, caring for the protection of the Germans' health by eradicating its, quote unquote, bad weeds. Emphasizing the myth of race, blood and soil allowed them to implement their racist propaganda onto the German people by advocating a back-to-nature revival that suggested that Germans and the landscapes were one, emphasizing the Dauerwald concept, which suggested that, quote, the garden of pure Germans, end quote, should be weeded off quote, malformation, system of disease, and weaker stands of plants of great importance for the preservation of nature as a whole, end quote. And how would you cure malaria? Cure malaria? Why do we want to cure malaria? Malaria is doing a great job. Leave malaria alone. Young man, you're drunk. Yes, I am. And in the morning, we'll both still be cunts. Have you come here just to drink? There's a blackout everywhere else. It's only held once every four years, this. The idea is to get people together who could never normally talk. Like politicians, world leaders, scientists. No one knows it exists. Is that what you are? A scientist, then. Must be a good one to get into here. Must be some kind of genius to get into no here. No offense. I'm sure you're great. But why don't you just fuck off? Why don't you make me? What's wrong with curing malaria? Or don't you want to make the world a better place? Let me explain something to you. The sun throws a certain amount of energy onto this planet. We turn it into food, clothing, shelter, etc. It supports an amount of us, and it took 30,000 years for that amount to become one billion. Then we found a way to use ancient sunlight, sunlight trapped in oil and coal. We started to live off that. What happened? In just 130 years, our population doubled. The next billion took 30 years. The fourth billion has taken just 14. So here's the question. What do you think is going to happen when that oil and coal runs out in, say, a hundred years? When there's ten billion living on a planet that can support only one? I think we're going to tear each other to shreds. At last, 
Someone with an ounce of fucking brain. In an interview with the New Zealand Herald, Utopia's creator Dennis Kelly said, quote, We're sleepwalking into something very difficult. When I started writing it, I knew we were coming up to 7 billion and it seemed like no one was talking about this. We were all talking about the environment, but we weren't talking about the obvious thing, which is that the pressures of the environment are largely caused by having a large population, end quote. Overpopulation has been a sort of controversial topic with opinions ranging from it's a myth to fix this or we're going to die. Utopia lends itself to the latter. And while I do think there are some issues that we definitely need to sort out, I don't think eugenics or mass murder is a particularly fruitful avenue to solve these issues. The effects of overpopulation are said to be CO2 emissions, water shortages, lack of resources, and just overall chaos. It's not surprising why anyone would be extremely paranoid about it. Many of the issues that are said to be caused by overpopulation are really just products of capitalism. This is the natural effect of catering to profits over people and the environment in which they live in. According to the UN, approximately 17% of the food produced globally each year is wasted. That amounts to 1.03 billion tons of food, and an estimate of 8-10% to of global greenhouse gases are associated with this food wastage. Oxfam reports in extreme carbon equality, quote, The poorest half of the global population are responsible for only around 10% of global emissions, yet live overwhelmingly in the countries most vulnerable to climate change, while the richest 10% of the people in the world are responsible for around 50% of the global emissions. The average footprint of someone in the richest 1% could be 175 times that of someone in the poorest 10%. End quote. So we see the issue is less whether we can provide enough food to feed our growing population, but more how do we distribute this food properly and sustainably. The topic of overpopulation has always been a racialized one, as population growth in poorer countries tend to be way higher than in richer countries, and these poorer countries have historically tended to be countries where black and brown people reside. Leanne McNulty writes in her article, The Overpopulation Myth is an Example of Ecofascism, Here's Why. In the 1960s and 70s, this doctrine continued. Influenced by Malthus, Paul Elric published The Population Bomb, in which he posited the absolute danger of allowing the human population to grow. Accounting his experience in Delhi, India, Elric wrote, quote, The streets seemed alive with people, people eating, people washing, people sleeping, people visiting, arguing, and screaming. People thrust their hands through the taxi window, begging. People defecating and urinating. People clinging to buses. People herding animals. People, 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 people. Since that night, I've known the feel of overpopulation. End quote. At the time of his trip, Delhi had a population of around 2.8 million. Paris, on the other hand, was home to 8 million residents. Elric spent time in both cities but only considered Delhi to be overcrowded despite Paris having almost three times as many people. In reality, the overcrowding that Elric saw was the result of poverty. His suggestion to deal with the overpopulation quote-unquote problem, widespread sterilization of the lower class, end quote. Ecofascist rhetoric has real-life implications, whether it's forced sterilizations, genocides, or mass murders. It's important that we know what ecofascism is so that we can identify it and steer clear of it. Can't wait for this to be, this to be, this to be.